the recording is running. And so, as you can see today, we have a guest lecturer. Uh, we have Ishan Misra. Uh, Ish Ishan Misra is a research scientist at Facebook AI Research Fair, where he works on computer vision and machine learning. His research interest is in uh, reducing the need for supervision in visual learning. Uh, he finished his PhD uh, at the Robotics Institute at the Carnegie Mellon University, where he worked with Martin Her um, Hebert and Abhinav Gupta. Uh, his PhD thesis was about, uh, it was titled Visual Learning with Minimal Human Supervision, for which he received the SCS Distinguished Dissertation Award so in 2018. So, uh, with less, or how do you say, with further ado, I don't know how to speak English. Uh, let's get, uh, we cannot even have the, the round of applause, you know. Can we have like in the chat, round of applause for our speaker? So everyone, uh, my name is Ishan. I'll be talking about self-supervised learning and computer vision today. Uh, and a lot of the focus is actually going to be sort of more on the discriminative style of approaches. Uh, and it's not really going to be on generative style of approaches. And I'll sort of go about it more and more as I go into my talk. <clears throat> so this sort of success story for um, representation learning or like computer vision so far has been really this sort of pre-training step or the ImageNet moment of um, like computer vision. So what has worked really well is that when we have a large label data set like ImageNet, we can learn a representation by performing an image classification task on this large data set. And what is very useful is not just performing this particular task at hand, but uh, to take these representations that you learn and then to use them for downstream tasks where you may not have enough label data. And this has worked really, really well and is sort of the more sort of standard recipe of success. Now, the, so this really involves collecting a large data set of supervised images. And you need to get a bunch of these large diverse images and label them with a bunch of large diverse concepts. So let's try to first see whether we can sort of uh, uh, collect these uh, labels and what are sort of the difficulties in doing so. So the ImageNet data set is a very sort of small data set in the sort of grander scheme of things. For example, ImageNet just has 14 million images and it has roughly 22,000 concepts. And just labeling this entire thing, if you look at the amount of effort that was spent, it's about 22 human years to label this entire data set. For contrast, a lot of people have started looking at these alternative supervision approaches where you are predicting something like not really a very sort of pristine, nice label, but something which is more easy to get. For example, predict like hashtags or predict GPS locations of images. Or what we're going to really focus on in this uh, lecture is going to be about like self-supervised learning, which is going to be using the data itself. So the first question that I always like to uh, sort of start out with is why, why don't you just like get labels for all your data? Why do you even want to invent this entire line of research? Why not just get all the labels? So I did this small exercise where I plotted uh, the amount of supervision that we have for vision data sets. Uh, so what I did is basically I looked at all the images which have bounding boxes. And so these are images where you know what kind of uh, concepts are in the image and you also have a box drawn around them. And this is sort of the standard thing to do for something like an object detection model. So if you look at all the data sets in vision that have bounding boxes, you'll get roughly about a million or so images. Now, if you relax this constraint and you say that, okay, I don't really care about where the object is located. All I care about is what objects are located, what objects are present in the image. And so if you relax that constraint, you immediately get an order of magnitude more data. So you'll basically get about, uh, yeah, about uh, 14 million images or so. Now, if you further sort of relax this constraint and you say that I don't really care about this image level supervision either, all I care about is internet, internet pictures that are present. In, you'll get basically about uh, five orders of magnitude more amount of data. And so if you look at this plot now, you can see immediately that the amount of data that we have, which is labeled even at a bounding box or an image level is basically nothing compared to what uh, images exist in the internet scale. And I haven't really forgotten these images, uh, like I've forgotten the bars on the left-hand side. It's just that they completely disappear. And you really need to make this plot something like a log plot to actually even get these bars to appear. So 
Now, of course, internet photos do not represent everything about the world. There are things that really require motion or things that really require other physical senses to learn. So in the real world, there are going to be far more things that you actually experience, far more sensory inputs that you can get. And it's really hard to obtain labels for all this data. And again, to put things in perspective, ImageNet, which is just 14 million images and with a very small number of concepts that you have, required a lot of time to label. So clearly labeling is not really going to scale to either all of internet photos or even the real world. So the other sort of problem with labeling is that uh, for complex concepts like video, it's just really hard to sort of scale labeling. The second problem is that rare concepts uh, sort of are really hard to label. So for example, this is one of the uh, popular image data sets called Label Me. And over here, we can see that if you look at the kinds of concepts you observe, there are a lot of concepts that are so rare that you're going to have to label a lot of data to even get a few instances of these concepts. So in this data set, 10% of the classes account for more than 93% of the data, which already tells you that in order to sort of scale uh, labeling to like more and more concepts, you'll need a lot and lot more data with very diminishing returns. So this is sort of the standard long tail problem. And of course, uh, pre-training um, is not right, always the right thing to do. For example, if you just completely change your domain to now move into say medical imaging, it's not clear whether ImageNet pre-training is the right sort of thing for this task. Or uh, if you do not know sort of the downstream task a priori, how do you collect a big data set and how do you do this entire pre-training a downstream task fine tuning recipe? So self-supervised learning sort of comes in between and it uh, tries to give you an alternate way to pre-train your models or to learn from data or learn from experiences without requiring pristine supervision. So in this case, uh, so there are sort of two simple definitions that you can come up with for self-supervised learning. The first is more from like a discriminative or like a supervised training perspective. So in ImageNet, for example, you have an image and you can it can be classified into one of thousand labels. So self-supervised learning can be thought of as a way to obtain labels from the data using an automatic process. So that automatic process does not really require a lot of human intervention. And so once you get these automatic labels, now you can sort of go ahead and train your model uh, with these labels. The other way of thinking about self-supervised learning is that it's really a prediction problem where you're trying to predict a part of the data from the other parts of the data. So you have some observed data and you have some hidden data. And you can now formulate a task where given the observed data, you try to predict either the hidden data or some property of the hidden data. And so pretty much a lot of sort of the self-supervised techniques can be viewed in this particular framework. So the term sort of self-supervised learning, uh, I really like to give this analogy, which is from Virginia Desa. So where uh, she sort of tries to distinguish between the three terms, supervised, unsupervised, and self-supervised. Uh, and so in supervised learning, you have say an input cow and you're given the exact target for it, which is say going to be the label cow. In unsupervised learning, you're given this input and it's not clear what really the entire target is, what exactly is the objective function or so on. Self-supervised learning uh, is sort of uh, the term which is preferred now uh, more and more. And the idea is that the label really comes from either a co-occurring modality or co-occurring part of the data itself. So really all of the power is in the data and you're really trying to predict, uh, sort of predict either parts of it or properties of the data. So some very sort of standard and successful examples of this are say either the word to vec model where given this uh, say a sentence, for example, the cat sits on the mat, you're given a part of the sentence that you observe. So which is in this case labeled as the context or the history. And then you have a part of the sentence uh, a word in this case, which is not observed, which you sort of hide from uh, this entire model. And given this context, you ask the model to predict this target. And so you have your self-supervised objective, you can minimize it in uh, a particular fashion, and now you will learn a representation for your input data. And word to vec has been uh, 
I mean, it has actually shown a lot of promise in variety of applications. And this entire sort of predictive model has inspired a lot of work in computer vision as well. The success of self-supervised learning uh, is sort of undebatable in natural language processing. So in 2018, there was this really successful model called BERT, uh, which basically is a form of a masked autoencoder. And this model has sort of revolutionized uh, the amount of things that you can do in NLP with limited amount of data. And a lot of people call this the ImageNet moment of NLP. So in this talk, uh, we'll sort of, again, to motivate why we want to use self-supervised learning. Uh, we are really going to focus on sort of how you can look at data and you can use observations and interactions of the data to formulate self-supervised tasks, how you can leverage multiple modalities. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about what this term modalities means or structure in the data to sort of learn uh, as representations. So let's move on to the context of computer vision. And I'll sort of now try to define things that I've been talking about in a slightly high level in more concrete fashion. First question. So yes. self-supervised learning is basically just unsupervised learning, right? Uh, yes. Uh, I mean, yes, yes. I mean, basically the sort of uh, main difference is like unsupervised is a sort of very... Uh, poorly defined term. So there is supervised, but what is unsupervised? So for example, the analogy given by Jitendra Malik is there is a cat, but there is no category called uncat. Uh, so that's the reason to sort of come, like prefer this term more and more that it's really about using the data or the properties of the data itself to come up with supervision. So that's why self-supervision. So someone is suggesting it's a subset. Yes, I guess. Yes. I mean, I guess, uh, you know, my, my reason for calling it this is that the, the algorithms, the algorithms are essentially the same as supervised learning algorithms with some modifications. Right. Because you're kind of training the system to learn part of, of its input from another part of the input. So it's very similar to supervised learning in many ways, except that you need to handle uncertainty better. Um, and the, the negative category, if you want, may be much larger, which is kind of an issue. But um, uh, unsupervised learning is really not very well defined. Self-supervised learning is kind of a better defined concept. It's not entirely clear it's a subset of unsupervised. Cool. Uh, so moving ahead, I'll now sort of try to uh, talk about self-supervised learning more in the context of vision. So in vision, uh, a lot of these sort of prediction problems have been framed as pretext tasks. So a lot of the vision algorithms sort of, uh, and this term comes more from 2015, where uh, from this particular paper by Carl Torsch. And the idea here was that you have a text task or the sort of task that you really care about at the end, like image classification. But of course, you don't have a lot of data for that or you... Uh, so you want to solve a task before going to the real task, so a pretext task. So this pretext task is a prediction task that you are solving, but it's not often the real task that you really care about. So you'll solve this particular task to learn a representation, and then you'll finally get your downstream task where you want to use this representation to perform something meaningful. So these pretext tasks are sort of funny. They're often uh, fairly like, uh, people got very creative with sort of coming up with these pretext tasks. So let's look at uh, how you can define a bunch of pretext tasks and what each of these pretext tasks is trying to do. And so you can use either images, video, video and sound when you're trying to do these things. And in each case, you'll have a bunch of observed data and you'll try to either predict hidden data or you'll try to predict the property of the hidden data. And this sort of distinguishes a bunch of approaches. So let's look at how you can use images to uh, define something like a pretext task. So the paper that introduced this term pretext task uh, came up with this fairly sort of funny method where uh, what you do is you take say two image patches, uh, basically uh, take the network and you ask the network to predict what is the relative position of each patch with respect to the other. So in this case, say I first sample a blue patch, and now I sample another red patch. 
So what I do is I basically uh, feed forward both of these patches through a comnet, and I have a classifier that is going to solve a eight-way classification problem. And how do I get the label for this classification problem? Well, I just look at where the red patch is located with respect to the blue patch, and that's it. So at the end of it, you're just predicting, you're just solving a eight-way classification task. You got your labels by basically uh, doing this sort of exploiting this property of the input data, and that's it. Now you you can use this to basically train and uh, this entire comnet. So it's a uh, to sort of look at it in a different way. It's only solving a very small classification problem. Uh, it's just solving basically an eight possible location sort of a problem. Surprisingly enough, doing this sort of pretext task actually learns something fairly reasonable. So. The one way to look at what this network has learned is to look at what it considers are nearest neighbors in its visual representation. So to explain this uh, plot a little bit more, on the left-hand side, you have the input patch. So you feed forward this input patch through that CNN. And um, you basically extract a bunch of patches on the data, on your data set. So in this case, ImageNet. And you compute feature representations for each of these patches. Now, for the particular input patch that you sent through the comnet, you compute the nearest neighbors uh, of all the patches from the data set. And you can use three different networks to do, compute the feature representations. Uh, so the first column is the relative positioning pretext task. Uh, in the second column is basically a randomly initialized AlexNet. And in the third case is, uh, third column is basically an ImageNet pre-trained AlexNet. So, um, if you f sort of look at what this relative positioning task is uh, capturing, it's really able to find very good patches, patches that are identical or very close to the input patch. And you also see that it's, uh, for example, like in the row of the cat, so that's the fourth row, you can see that it's actually able to figure out it's slightly invariant to say the color. So the input cat was black and white, but it's actually able to pick out cats which are not just black and white. So it's really doing something. It's trying. It's a, at least able to reason about patches as a whole. So why should this representation do anything which is semantic? So the nearest neighbor visualization technique is good at telling you what this representation space has captured. So in this case, what we can confidently say is that this relative patch representation has learned to sort of associate a bunch of these local patches together, local patches that have roughly the same appearance. And so because it is able to reason about these local patches, maybe it's actually able to reason about an image because image can sort of be viewed as a bunch of local patches together. So it's able to sort of put these patches in one part of the representation space. The, uh, now, people have, like I said, people have gotten fairly creative with uh, the kinds of pretext tasks they do. So, another sort of popular uh, pretext task is predicting rotations of an image. And this, uh, so this task is very straightforward. You have an image, you can either apply a rotation of zero degrees, 90 degrees, 180 degrees, or 270 degrees to it. And basically, you send in that particular image after applying a rotation. And you ask the network to predict what was the exact rotation applied to the image. And it just solves a four-way classification problem. So it predicts basically either if the rotation is 0, 90, 180, or 270. And this uh, pretext task is actually one of the most popular pretext tasks now because it's so easy to implement. You basically just take an image. It's very, very simple. Nah, you don't really need to sample too many patches or solve any sort of complicated thing. It's a very standard architecture and you can solve this. And it's become fairly popular now. So the network is gonna be basically trained. So the feature are trained in order to solve this problem, right? So yes, in, yes. the output will be somehow uh, dependent on the specific task someone is gonna be picking somehow, right? Yes, so this is sort of, again, this is a pretext task. So we are not really interested in predicting the rotations of an image. We are just using this task as a proxy to learn some features so that on the downstream task, so say when someone gives us a thousand labels images of a cat, we can then use this pre-trained feature representation to do that particular task. Uh, so these pretext mm -hmm. tasks are often really not going to make a lot of semantic sense. Uh, and that's probably like that's sort of the reason for calling them pretext. Uh, because you have a downstream task where you actually have some semantic or some uh, label that you actually know is good. Uh, 
Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Why would the predicting rotations give us any sort of useful um, representations? Yes. Uh, so in fact, when this paper came out, this was the question of many, many people. And uh, it was my question as well. Uh, empirically, this actually works really well. Uh, and sort of my intuition for this has basically been that in order to predict uh, what sort of the rotation of an object is, it needs to roughly understand what the boundaries or what sort of some concepts in this image are. For example, to predict that this uh, particular image is rotated by 180 degrees, it needs to at least recognize or sort of segregate the sky from like the sand or the sky from the water. Or at least understand that for a tree, the leaves are generally not below uh, sort of the bar. Trees don't go grow like downwards, they grow upwards. So it sort of needs to reason about some things implicitly. It's not super clear what it really needs to do, but this task uh, empirically works very well. Has this only been tried or, or works as a task with like a discrete classification or has it has it been tried on like a continuous scale of angles at which the image is rotated? Yes, so uh, you can do both versions. Uh, so you can, I mean, you can sort of increase the number of bins you want and as you basically make it very, very large, you're approaching more of a regression problem where you have a continuous variable. Uh, in practice, these four sort of angles work pretty well. Uh, mm -hmm. you, I mean, increasing gives marginal benefits. Mm. And there's a question about the previous slide. Yes. Uh, how does the nearest neighborhood work in this context? Do you run every patch, each patch through the CNN? Yes. So this is just for visualization. This is just for sort of understanding. So it, it although it is like sort of expensive to uh, compute this, it gives you a very good idea of what the representation has learned. So what uh, the authors did was basically extract a bunch of patches from each image, roughly 10 to uh, nine patches. And so, uh, on a small set of images. So I think in this case, it was like 50 to 100,000 images. And then you basically just compute nearest neighbors on those, those patches of those images. Is that clear? Yeah, yeah that's it. Okay. Cool. So another task, which is uh, also fairly popular is called colorization. So in this case, uh, given a grayscale image, uh, you basically try to predict the colors of that image. So you can really formulate this task for any image. You can take an image, um, you can remove its color, and you can ask a network to basically predict the color from this black and white or sort of grayscale image. And this task by itself is not as, uh, it's actually useful in some respect. So uh, a lot of like old movies, when you sort of see them colorized, uh, so like movies shot in say the 40s or 30s when there was not, not a lot of color technology, you can actually have this task really sort of be applied there. So in some way it actually is more useful than other pretext tasks. Uh, and why does this task learn something meaningful? Well, it needs to sort of recognize that trees are green. It needs to understand what the sort of object categories in, is in order to color it fairly well. And so in practice, this has now sort of been extended to the video domain. Um, and there are a lot of follow-up works on sort of colorization itself. It's interesting because I think the color mapping is not, deter it's not deterministic, right? I mean, it's not deterministic, yes. So several, several po there are several po um, possible true yes. solutions, right? Yes. So, uh, so the initial paper was basically uh, sort of proposing a deterministic mapping. So you were solving a, either a classification or a regression problem. Uh, so you only could have, say, a blue colored umbrella. And if you could never sort of predict a gray colored umbrella. <laughs> uh, and so what ended up happening was for a lot of uh, categories which have different kinds of colors. Uh, so for example, uh, let's assume, say, you have a ball and that ball can appear either in red, blue, or green colors. The network would sort of predict that to be gray because, well, I mean, that's sort of the mean of all of these things. So that's the best it can do. Mm -hmm. There was follow-up work from uh, David Forsyth's group in UIUC, which uh, tried to sort of come up with variational autoencoders. So you actually had a latent variable, exactly. and then you could have diverse colorization. So in practice, you can basically do approaches like that. So you can actually have now a green colored ball. And because you're doing that for the entire scene, you can actually have consistent colorings of the entire scene. Yeah, yeah, that's what I think we've been we've been talking with Jan. No, whenever we have like some uh, mapping that goes from one to many, then we uh, should 
uh, choose like a, a latent variable model, which allow us to choose a multiple solution given that we have the same input. Right. Right. Yeah. So if uh, I think the reason why like people did not really focus on a lot on that particular aspect in this case was uh, at least back in the day, one, it was not clear what was working and what was not. And second, this was still a pretext task and people were not really concerned about the colorization quality. People were more concerned about the representation quality. But I think now a lot of us understand that both of them are fairly sort of tied to one another, that you really need to have this sort of non-deterministic mapping to get something more out of the data. Mm -hmm. I see. Thanks. Yeah. And finally, so this is, uh, and I apologize for this picture. It's from the paper. and I think it was low resolution. Uh, but so this is another task, which is like uh, context autoencoders. So the idea is basically borrowed pretty much from say word to vec. So you hide a particular part of the image and now given the surrounding part of the image, you need to predict what was hidden. So it's really a sort of the fill in the blanks task. And why should this work? Well, it's at least trying to reason about what objects are present. Uh, so cars uh, can run on roads or like buildings are basically consist, consist of like windows and closer to the ground, they're supposed to have doors and so on. So it needs to learn something more about like the implicit structure of the data uh, by performing this task. So this was just about images. Uh, and now I'll sort of talk about what are the other tasks that you can do in video. So in video, uh, the sort of main source of supervision is this notion of sequentiality of uh, frames. So frames basically have an inherent order in them and you want to sort of use that order to get something. For example, say predict the order of frames or fill in the planks and a bunch of sort of other pretext tasks that are all dependent on sequential nature. So uh, here I'll sort of talk about one of the works that I did in 2016, which was about predicting the temporally correct or incorrect order of frames. This is very much inspired from uh, earlier work that Jan and basically others did on sort of sequential ordering of frames through contrastive learning. And I'll talk about those uh, towards the end when I actually talk about contrastive learning. So in this particular work, we were very much inspired by like the pretext tasks again, and we solve a binary classification problem. So given a bunch of frames, we extract three frames and it, uh, if we extract them in the right order, we label them plus one. And if we shuffle them, basically we label them as zero. And so now you need to solve a binary classification problem to predict whether something is shuffled or not. And the reason this sort of works is because, um, so given three frames, uh, let's uh, think of them as basically start, middle, and end. This network really tries to learn, uh, given a start and end point, is this point a valid sort of interpolation of these start and end points? So it really tries to sort of interpolate um, smoothly these features uh, given, these, given this visual input. So the network is fairly straightforward. It's a sort of triplet Siamese network. You have three frames. Uh, you feed forward each one of them independently. You concatenate the features that you obtain from these three frames, and then you perform a binary classification problem. So you predict whether this thing is correct or incorrect, whether it's basically uh, shuffled or not shuffled. You get a uh, you can basically minimize this with cross entropy loss, and you can train this entire network end to end. So uh, again, uh, like I had mentioned earlier, nearest neighbor is sort of a good way to visualize what these networks are learning. So uh, we followed prior work and we basically looked at the nearest neighbors uh, of frames. So on the left-hand side, you have a query frame. Uh, you feed forward that frame, you get a feature, and then you basically uh, look at the nearest neighbors in that feature representation. So we'll do that for ImageNet, shuffle and learn, and then random features. So what you observe is uh, there's sort of, sort of very stark difference between what ImageNet, shuffle, and random give you. So in the first row, if you look at the, the sort of gym scene, ImageNet is really good at figuring out that it's a gym scene. It's the nearest neighbor it retrieves looks very different from the initial scene that we, like the initial image that we've given. So like the floor is much better lit. Uh, in the query, the floor was actually black. Uh, and the exact exercise being performed is not really the same. 
but imagenet is sort of really good at collapsing this entire semantic category and really sort of bringing in various different gym scenes together close by in the representation space uh the same thing sort of goes for the row below so you have a outdoor scene and imagenet is immediately able to sort of pick up on that outdoor part of it it's able to figure out that there is grass and so on and it sort of brings these two points together uh in the feature space if you look at say the sort of rightmost the nearest neighbors retrieved by the random network you see that it really focuses on the color so in the top row it's really sort of focusing on the black floor it's really looking at maybe it's sort of the black uh color in this image and that's how it's retrieving its nearest neighbor now if you look at the shuffle and learn a nearest neighbors they're fairly odd it's not immediately clear whether it's focusing on the color or whether it's focusing on that entire semantic concept and so on sort of further inspection and after looking at a lot of these examples we figured out that it was really looking at the pose of the person so if you look at in the top row the person is doing sort of an upside is upside down and that's sort of the nearest neighbor retrieved as well and in the second row also the person is sort of ha has their foot in a like has their feet in a particular way and it's really trying to sort of get there with its nearest neighbor and it's sort of ignoring the entire scene so it's not really focused on the background and when we were thinking about this why would a network even try to do something of this sort well we looked uh, we thought back to our pretext task so the pretext task was predicting the order or basically predicting whether things are in the right order or not and to do this you really need to focus on what is moving in the scene or sort of the in this case the people so if you focus on the background you'll never be able to answer this question fairly well because well the background doesn't change a lot between three frames that are taken sort of close by in a video the only thing that sort of changes is the person or the sort of things that are moving in that video so sort of accidentally we basically trained a network that was really trying to sort of look at things that are moving and then ended up focusing on the pose of this uh, pose of people now of course this is my interpretation uh, we wanted to verify this quantitatively uh, so what we did is we took our representation and we fine tuned it on this task of human key point estimation so this task is basically a uh, given up human you need to sort of uh, predict where certain key points are so the key points are going to be uh, they're defined as basically say the nose the neck uh the so left shoulder right shoulder right elbow left elbow wrist and so on so you basically have these bunch of predefined key points and you train a network to sort of predict this so this is really useful for something like tracking or pose estimation of a person so we took our uh, shuffle and learn self supervised method uh and we fine tuned it on these two data sets called flick and npii and we did the same thing for Uh, imagenet supervised network and this is back in the days of alexnet so alexnet was the architecture that we used and in sort of sur fairly surprisingly what we found is that the self supervised representation was very competitive or even slightly better than imagenet supervised representation at this task of uh, key point estimation so in this case what i'm measuring is auc which is area under the curve so higher is better and you can see that it's performing fairly well which was very surprising to us because we hadn't really thought about this task when we were uh, designing our pretext task we really thought that doing this pretext task will help us understand actions better uh, but it turns out that if like you you can have sort of surprising outcomes depending on what you ended up or what you end up uh, creating as a pretext task so in this case that was pose estimation so for this example um you said you fine tuned it on human key point estimation so right. is that kind of like a supervised step at like once you have your um yes. pretext representations yes so uh, so the pipeline basically generally goes like you have you do a pre training step so that can basically be say imagenet supervision which is predicting one of thousand classes and then you have a downstream task where you have a few amount of labels so you basically just uh, so in this case that's predicting the human key points so the this way of evaluation what it does is it basically has a, it takes a bunch of pre trained networks and then it fine tunes them using the same supervised data at the end and so what you're evaluating is um, 
how good was it if i started from say a image net supervised network or a shuffle and learn network to perform this task of key point estimation ah, okay thank you yeah. isn't it strange that uh, it did so this well since shuffle and learn focuses on the background uh so it actually focuses a lot on the foreground uh, so that's what i was trying to sort of come up with this uh, talk about in this example so if you look at like what the nearest neighbors are it's really looking at the person to come up with this right it's looking at the upside down person to sort of uh, come up with its nearest neighbor okay and the reason is if you want to talk about ordering of frames i really need to focus on things that move and in these videos people are the things that move so if it focuses on the background it actually will not be able to solve the shuffle and learn task right uh so this was sort of surprising and uh it sort of goes to show that if you design your pretext task well it will work well for a certain sort of set of downstream tasks and there have been sort of fairly nice uh methods so, uh since then which have been basically about predicting this uh sort of using sequentiality and sort of predicting whether things are in the correct order or not so this is odd one out networks which basically rather than solving a binary classification problem it actually tries to predict which uh, which of the frames is the un, like sort of the uh, one that is odd one out the one that is sort of uh, shuffled and this because you're sort of increasing the amount of information that you're predicting at the output uh, this sort of network ends up doing better and better and it also sort of reasons about more frames at a time so now you've seen sort of images and video uh, there has been a lot of creative work at the sort of multi modal so where you have two modalities video and sound or two sensory inputs and these two have been sort of very popular and fairly nice uh, uh, sort of work coming out of this uh, regime so the key sort of signal in in these works is uh, predicting whether an image or say a video clip corresponds to an audio clip so the way you can sort of construct these tasks is to take a video uh and you can basically just sample any frame from it and this is similarly take an audio track and sample any part of that and now the problem is basically to predict whether these things are corresponding or not so essentially given this entire sort of video say of a drum uh you can sample the frame and the corresponding audio and call that the positive uh and in this case you basically take uh, a different video and you take the audio from the drum video and that becomes your negative and so again you can solve a binary classification problem by taking these bunch of positives and negatives so the architecture for this is fairly straightforward uh, you take in an image you pass it through a vision subnetwork uh, you have your audio you pass it through an audio subnetwork you get 128 dimensional features for them so also embeddings uh, then you sort of uh, fuse them together and have a binary classification problem saying whether these things correspond or not so at the end of it it's just solving a single binary problem uh what it sort of shows is that uh it you can actually do a bunch of sort of nice things when you train networks this way so you can answer the question what is making a sound because the network really needs to focus on say uh to predict whether this sound is coming from this video it also needs to identify what in the video might be making the sound so uh if it's the sound of a guitar it needs to sort of understand what a guitar roughly looks like um or if it's a drum it sort of needs to roughly identify what a drum is um so in this particular case uh the author sort of looked at visualizations uh for in this case two instruments so you have a piano and a flute and if you look at just the video information and nothing else the network auto, uh, already sort of puts a very high uh, sort of visual uh, importance on the piano and on the flute and this is because it auto, when you sort of feed forward this image it knows that there are going to be these two kinds of things that can produce sounds so it really sort of uh, learns to identify these kinds of objects automatically do you know uh, about the, the the slide before uh, whenever you had the convolutional net over the yes. spectrogram 
Uh, do you know what yes. is the kernel size for that audio component? Just, I'm interested to know, like, whether it makes sense to have, like, a rectangular or a square kernel size? So, these goes... are uh, square kernels. Uh, I mean, now there are m sort of more improved models. So, this is basically operating on the log spectrogram. So, yeah. in some way, it is still handcrafted. You need to decide how you're computing that spectrogram exactly. Uh -huh. uh, people have now figured out that you can actually use the raw audio and you can actually apply convolutional filters directly on the raw audio signal. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure, sure. Um, and for that, it's generally a small window. It really depends on uh, what the corresponding video that you're using. So mm -hmm. roughly about a second's worth of audio and a second's worth of video. Gotcha. Cool. So now that I've sort of shown you how there are like multiple different creative ways of defining what a pretext task is, let's try to see uh, what a pretext task learns and how can you sort of, if, the, if I give you 25 different pretext tasks, how can you a priori decide which one is the one that you want to use and what are they going to sort of uh, learn? So the first thing is pretext tasks are actually complementary. Uh, so there was this really nice paper in 2017 that looked at uh, two of these sort of tasks. So relative position was the uh, first pretext task I talked about, where you take two patches and you try to predict what their relative position with respect to one another is. And colorization is basically taking a grayscale image and trying to predict its colors. And so what these authors showed is basically that if you uh, train a single network to do both of these tasks, to predict both the colorized, colorized output as well as relative position, you can actually get gains in performance. So again, this is evaluated the same way I was talking about earlier. You have a pre-trained network, and then you're basically evaluating it on an end task, in this case, image net classification and a detection benchmark. And in both cases, you sort of can get uh, gains by performing both of these tasks. So you get best of both worlds. So in some way, what this also shows you is that a single pretext task may not be the right answer. So predicting just color or predicting just relative position may not be the right answer. Uh, to learn uh, self-supervised representations. In fact, if you sort of reason about what information is being predicted, it really varies a lot across tasks. So starting with the relative position task, you're predicting a fairly low level information. You're predicting just sort of eight possible locations. So just an eight way classification problem. Or for that shuffle and learn problem, you're predicting whether things are shuffled or not. So it's just a simple binary problem. So it's very sort of less amount of information that's being predicted. Whereas if you look at on the extreme right, if you are trying to predict what is missing in an image and you're trying to reconstruct the pixels, you're predicting a lot of information because that entire box contains, I mean, it can have a very, you can have very different appearance space, right? So if you have N pixels, then you can basically have a lot of different values for that entire predictive region. So you're predicting a lot of information there. So essentially, this is one simple way of thinking about pretext tasks. How much information are you predicting? And that can give you already a good idea of, uh, you know, whether you're actually predicting a lot of information. So probably that representation is actually going to be better. So in general, uh, this is sort of going to guide the next part of my talk. Uh, you can think of uh, this sort of predicting more information part as a, on an axis, and I'll talk about three different sort of categories in this. Uh, actually, two different categories. So pretext tasks is what I've been talking about till now, which is just predicting simple classification problems, uh, like different uh, degrees of rotation or so on. I'll sort of move to contrastive uh, methods, which are which actually predict way more information than these pretext tasks. And... In this uh, particular talk, I'm actually not going to talk about generative models, but generative models predict more information than, say, a typical contrastive method. And so uh, this is basically one way of thinking about these uh, classes of methods. Question. How do we train multiple per training uh, pre-training tasks? Do we shuffle data for both tasks? If training individually, won't it uh, lead to catastrophic forgetting? Right. So... Uh, the simple way of doing that is basically that you uh, have, so you can basically alternate batches. So you can have the same network and in one batch, you basically feed it black and white images and you ask it to predict the colored part of it. And in the second, uh, now in the second batch, you basically uh, uh, feed it patches and you ask it to do the relative position tasks. You basically have two different uh, uh, like head or uh, like fully connected layers at the top. 
So you can basically alternate between these tasks. What the authors of the paper did was actually slightly more sophisticated. They had, uh, they basically had a sort of multitask network, which was three or four, depending on the number of pretext tasks you have. And you actually solve all of them at once. But they, there was sort of more involved weight sharing across these four or three, four different tasks, uh, networks. Got it. Uh, hi, I have yeah. a question. Yes. Uh, so about the pretext task, uh -huh. what performance should we aim for in a pretext task? When do we know that this is enough or when can we stop? And because ultimately we care about the performance on the downstream. Right. Uh, that's question one. And uh, question two is you were speaking about low information and more information. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, in the case where you mentioned, where you were predicting whether it's in the correct sequence or not, mm -hmm. you could have also predicted the actual permutation of the images, right? Like right. So how do you decide between which task to follow and based on what? Right. Okay. So uh, both parts. The second part uh, of the question, actually, that's going to be in a couple of slides. So I'll sort of defer to that question, uh, that one later. But the first part, how much do you train this model on a pretext task? So a sort of good sign of a pretext task is that as you, your accuracy on the pretext task improves, so as you get better at predicting whether things are shuffled or not, or as you get better at predicting rotations, the uh, sort of accuracy on the downstream semantic task will also improve. So a good rule of thumb for basically using these pretext tasks is to sort of have a very um, difficult pretext task or try to make it as difficult as possible and then sort of optimize or like reduce the loss on that pretext task so, so that your final downstream accuracy improves. So it's very correlated. Right. So in practice, you'll actually drain the entire pipeline each line each time, like the pretext and the downstream and measure the performance in, right? So it's not like you stop the pretext at a certain point and then switch over to only like downstream or something. So that's how generally how these methods are evaluated. Um, but I guess when you're developing, you'll probably do this pipeline multiple times. So these methods are sort of trained, like you pre, uh, do your pretext task, then you stop, and then you perform your downstream evaluation task. And that gives you the final sort of measurement of how good your pretext task was. And that's it. You do, do this entire thing once. Right. Thank you. Yeah. And about the, uh, the second part of your question, the more information part, I'll sort of come to it later, the, the permutation and so on. Cool. So these are sort of the three main buckets. Uh, and the first two are what are uh, going to be covered basically now. So this was another work we did, which was basically about scaling self-supervised learning. So in this particular work, we focused on um, two problems. One was the colorization problem that I had talked about earlier. And the second is this um, more sort of... Uh, Inform, like more information variant of the relative position task. So this task is called jigsaw puzzles. The idea is that you take an image and you split it into multiple different patches and you try to predict exactly, and you, then you shuffle these patches basically by a permutation. And then you predict which permutation was applied to the input. So that's very similar to what Shreyas was uh, suggesting earlier. All right. So the way you solve this problem is you uh, take, say, in this case, three patches. You feed forward each one of these patches independently. You concatenate their feature. And then you classify which permutation was basically used to uh, permute these input patches. Now, the authors used nine patches to solve this problem. And that's basically going to be nine factorial, which is uh, like 360,000 uh, number of permutations. Of course, when you're trying to perform this classification at the end, this means that your fully connected layer should have 360,000 output neurons, which is a very large number. So in practice, what the authors did was basically uh, have a sort of a subset of permutations that they use. Uh, so uh, say they sample 100 permutations from the nine factorial permutations, and then just have this perform this 100-way classification. Right? So in some way, you can look at this, uh, the size of this subset as the problem complexity or the amount of information that you're predicting. If you predict the full nine factorial thing, you're actually solving, like, you're basically predicting a lot of information at the output. Uh, 
if you only subsample say two or three permutations then you're basically not predicting a lot of information so the problem basically gets harder and harder as the size of the subset increases so in this paper we basically wanted to study this the entire role of uh, how, how much information that you predict and how good is the final representation that you learn so in terms of evaluation there are two ways to sort of evaluate once you have a uh, self supervised pre trained network and there's still a lot of debate on which one is exactly the right method to evaluate networks so the first way is to basically fine tune all the layers of a network so at you have a downstream task say pose estimation or say image classification you train this network and you update all the parameters of this network for the downstream task the second way is to just uh, use your network as a feature extractor so you basically run your images through it you get your feature representation and now you only train a linear classifier on top of that fixed feature representation so in this particular work uh, we said that a good representation should transfer with little amount of training so we opted basically for the second part which is just to train a linear classifier on top of a network treated as a feature extractor so there are of course different pros and cons of using both methods so the first method that is fine tuning all the layers is treating uh, the self supervised network as a initialization because you're basically updating the entire network so if your downstream task basically has say 1 million images you're basically updating your entire network for that 1 million images whereas in the second case you're just training very limited number of parameters on the feed fixed feature extractor uh, so in some way basically the second one is measuring how good of a feature is that uh, that you've learned all right so the other thing that is sort of critical in evaluating self supervised methods is to evaluate them on a, on a bunch of different tasks so earlier when i talked about that shuffle and learn work i just showed you results on pose estimation so on pose estimation it was doing really well but uh, it actually did not do really well on other tasks like say action recognition so in this particular evaluation uh, we sort of wanted to correct that mistake and we wanted to focus on multiple different tasks so a variety of different tasks like say image classification few short learning object detection 3d understanding navigation and so on so we defined basically like a set of nine different tasks so uh, the way to evaluate the representations is basically to extract fixed features and you can extract these fixed features from different parts of the network so they can come basically from a layer which is very close to the input or from a very high level layer which is very close to the output so in this way you're sort of measuring the semanticness of each of these different layers and the sort of standard thing we did for a lot of these experiments was to use an image classification task to uh, sort of understand what is going on so the image classification task is on this dataset called voc which is fairly standard for detection and classification and the idea is to predict uh, whether an image has one of 20 classes so uh, and an image can actually have more than one class for example uh, like that picture of a person with a dog that has both person and dog so this network now needs to recognize both the objects in it so it's not slightly harder than image net where you basically need to only uh, sort of identify one of the key objects in the image so uh, so the first thing we did was basically to verify the hypothesis whether increasing the amount of information predicted actually results in better uh, representations so on the x axis we are increasing the number of permutations that we are using to basically train our network so that's going from 100 to 10000 Uh, and on the y axis we are basically measuring the downstream transfer performance of these pretrained representations and it's measured using a metric called map which is mean average precision so essentially because this is a fairly uh, this is a sort of multi level classification problem you're going to measure average precision for each of the different 20 classes and then you're going to compute the mean of that average precision so higher is better in this case so we do that for two different architectures alexnet which was originally used in the jigsaw paper and then resnet 50 and what you observe is uh, for alexnet increasing the amount of permutations is useful up to a certain point but the gain is overall limited whereas for resnet if you increase the amount of permutations the representation quality gets better and better uh, and our hypothesis was basically that the resnet model has enough capacity that it can actually solve a very difficult permutation problem uh, 
and when it solves that difficult permutation problem it's able to sort of learn much better representations that generalize to different downstream tasks right so the next thing we did was to evaluate our method on the object detection task so object detection is basically where you try to identify what objects are present in an image you try to draw a box around them and you're measured basically based on how sort of good the box is around the object and whether you uh, were able to identify all the objects in an image and again for this one we use the same voc data set so this was the setting where we basically fine tuned all the layers of a network because that's what standard in detection and what we observed was basically on two different uh, splits of this voc data set uh, the jigsaw method was actually fairly comparable uh, within the margin of error to basically training a imagenet supervised uh, method so you have a imagenet supervised network you fine tune that on the task of detection and you get a mean average precision of 70.5 or 76.2 and the jigsaw method is basically within the margin of error of these um, methods which in itself sort of shows that uh it actually had some sort of nice semantic property and it was able to localize objects really well and to put this sort of in context uh for semantic feature learning on like in computer vision especially object detection is sort of considered the benchmark data set to to reach something like really well on and Uh, this result basically when we sort of published it was the closest anyone had ever come to supervised pre training uh, you know, in terms of detection right so yes some question um so is pre text tasks uh, similar to what we could try achieving with transfer learning is it like a subset of that or Yes, yeah, so I mean the way you evaluate these pretext tasks is by transfer learning. So you perform mm -hmm. your original pretext task, and then you fine tune it on a data set uh, for a particular task, like detection. So the evaluation is always transfer learning. Okay. So the next task we looked at was uh, surface normal evaluation. Uh, so this is basically. Given uh, input, you try to estimate what are the three D properties of the uh, like. basically at each pixel location in the input so you try to predict what is the surface orientation so in 3d basically the x y and z uh, vectors uh, at each particular surface so it's a sort of dense prediction problem where you need to assign that x y z vector to each location in the input and for that we use this uh, nice data set created by and by you um uh, and we basically measured the prediction properties of our method uh, with uh, and compared it to an imagenet supervised method and so in this case we measured the median error and the percentage correct predictions uh, so the median error basically means that lower is better and percentage correct means higher is better so it turned out that uh, the jigsaw pre training task was actually really good in this case and it provided like significant improvements over imagenet pre training so it was basically across some multiple different sets multiple different splits it was able to really easily outperform the imagenet supervised pre trained method so again it sort of goes on to show that evaluating a pre text task on multiple different tasks and multiple different data sets is really important to understand what is really going on in your pre text task so somehow jigsaw is really incorporating something about uh, like geometry and something about like pixel level information much better than imagenet supervised methods so finally we found sort of the achilles heel of this method uh like the jigsaw pre training task so to do this we evaluated on like uh the setting called few shot learning so in few shot learning you have very sort of limited number of training examples and you are training your classifier just on these very limited number of training examples so on the x axis i have the number of training examples that were used to train a method uh, so that goes from say 1 to 96 and i'm sort of showing you curves for four like a self like two different self supervised methods so jigsaw methods trained on two different data sets imagenet which is on the top and a random resnet 50 so what you can observe is that there is a significant gap in performance between a self supervised method and a supervised method and that gap basically just does not seem to reduce as you increase the number of labeled examples 
which point sort of shows that self supervised representations although they may be good at tasks like say pose estimation or particular tasks like surface normal estimation there is still a lot of difference between what sort of semantic uh, aspect of the data they capture because this in this sort of few shot learning task if i give you one image and if you're able to say something about it your feature representation needs to be really good to solve that task and the other way we evaluated this uh, method was to basically look at what it learns at each different layer so we basically trained uh, uh, linear classifiers on different uh, like different layer representations in a resnet 50 so from the con1 which is going to be the layer closest to the input to the output say of the res2 block the res3 block and the res5 block so res5 is basically the sort of highest level representation that you'll get out from a resnet 50 and after that representation is where you perform this entire jigsaw like predicting the permutation task and so you look at in this case the x axis represents the sort of where the feature is coming from con1 or res5 and on the y axis we are looking at the again mean average precision of uh, image classification on voc and funnily enough what you see is basically that uh, the representation quality improves when you go from con1 to res4 so it steadily sort of increases in the mean average precision but towards the end there's a sharp drop so res4 to res5 is a sharp drop in performance which is, is that due to the fact that it specializes to the specific task yes yes exactly so yes. this was very worrying because if you were to sort of plot this thing for a supervised network you observe that from con1 to res5 the representation quality always improves and this is true for like pretty much any good supervised network whereas for a lot of the self supervised networks we sort of repeated this experiment for the rotation network for colorization for relative position we would always observe this very sharp gap uh, from res4 to res5 and so this says that the end task that we are solving the pretext task is probably not very nice because it's not very well aligned to the uh, downstream semantic tasks that we really want to solve which basically brings me to the next part which is to understand what is missing from these pretext or these sort of proxy tasks so to recap pretext tasks are basically something like predicting rotation or to predict say jigsaw puzzles and it's very sort of uh, if you look at it in the bigger picture of things they are very surprising and um, the fact that they even work is super surprising so for pretext tasks we have this pre training step where which is self supervised and then we have our transfer tasks which are image classification or detection and it's really a lot of wishful thinking and a lot of hope that the pre training task and the transfer task are super aligned and there is no evidence really it's a lot of just like wishing really really hard that whatever pretext task we've come up with is really well aligned with our transfer task and solving that pretext task will do really well in transfer task so a lot of research basically goes into designing these pretext tasks and implementing them really well but it's not clear why solving something like jigsaw puzzles should teach us anything about semantics or for example even in the case of say weak supervised learning where you're trying to predict hashtags from an image it's not clear why predicting hashtags of an image is actually going to do something well for uh, learning some like a good classifier on transfer tasks so this question remains that how do you design good pre training tasks which are well aligned with your transfer tasks so this hope of generalization is uh basically uh you can and the way we can sort of evaluate this is basically by looking at the representations at each layer and at if if the last layer we do not see representations that are well aligned with the transfer task then that is a red flag and that sort of telling us that maybe this pre training task is not really the right task to solve uh so like i mentioned earlier this basically is the sort of pattern that we'll get for jigsaw and this shows us that probably the uh, last layers are very much specialized towards the jigsaw problem right so in general what we really want from pre trained features is that they should represent how images are related to one another so feature representations should and this basically goes back to say the nearest neighbor visualizations that i had 
they should really be able to group together images that are semantically related in some way and the second property is basically a property that has been the backbone of designing vision features so even before say the deep learning features were popular the handcrafted features were always all about invariance about sort of being invariant to things like lighting or things like exact color or exact location so these are the two properties that we really want in our pretend features and there are sort of two ways of achieving these things uh, one is clustering and the other is contrastive learning and both these methods have promise because they are really solving uh, they're basically trying to get these uh, properties when they're sort of trying to learn representations and i believe that's why they have actually now started performing so much better than whatever pretext tasks that were hand designed for so far so um now i'll sort of focus on two recent works that we have uh, which are um, which fall into this bucket of clustering and um, invariances so one is called cluster fit the other is called pearl and both of them will be presented at cvpr this year so the first work is cluster fit uh, it's a method which we think is very good uh, to improve generalization of visual representations so clustering is basically a good way to understand what images are grouped together what images go together and what images do not go together and it's sort of you by basically performing clustering on the feature space you can get these nice buckets of images that are related and images that are not related so the main idea of this paper is extremely simple uh, there are just two steps one is the cluster step the other is the predict step so what we do is we take any a pretrained network and this can be any pretrained network it uh, it does not really have to be just a self supervised network it can either be a image net pretrained network or a network pretrained say using hashtags or a self supervised network like one trained to predict jigsaw permutations and you take this pretrained network and you extract a bunch of features uh, from it on a set of images and of course these images have no labels you extract these features and you perform k means clustering and what you now get is basically uh, for each label uh, for each image you know which cluster it belongs to and that becomes its label so in the second fit step what you do is you train a network from scratch uh, so like from random bits and you train this network to predict just these pseudo labels uh, so they're pseudo because they were basically obtained using clustering so they're not really hard labels uh, which were given by say a human annotator and so now this second network is just trained to predict these cluster assignments so it takes our image and it tries to predict which one of the k clusters that you got from your k means does this image belong to so a standard uh, pretrain and transfer task is to basically perform your pretraining so that's the top row uh is to perform your pretraining on an objective like predicting hashtags or predicting gps locations and then to evaluate this feature uh based by learning say a linear probe in the cluster fit world we uh, basically do not touch the pretraining so you perform your pretraining as you were uh you just insert a step in between which is the cluster fit step where you uh take a data set d and you take your pretrained network and you learn a new network from scratch on this data and finally uh, you basically use this like green network for all your downstream tasks so the reason we believe that this uh, method works is because the clustering step when you're sort of clustering just these images you're only capturing the essential uh, information which is basically what images go together and what images do not go together so you're throwing away all the other information that is present in the original network you're just capturing uh, the sort of inter image relationships that were captured uh, that were modeled by the initial network uh, and to sort of understand this we performed a fairly simple experiment we added label noise so synthetic label noise to image net and we trained a network uh, basically on this noisy image net so just flip a bunch of image labels uh, and train a network and now you evaluate the feature representation from this network on a downstream task which is again imagenet but it's a much larger version of imagenet so it's 9000 way classification uh, so 
we basically uh, on the x axis have the amount of label noise added to the images so that's going from 0% to 75% and on the y axis we are looking at the transfer performance on the larger image net the image net 9000 data set so the pink line is showing you the pre trained network which is and basically as the amount of label noise increases the pre trained network's performance on the downstream task decreases and well this is not surprising because uh, as your labels become less and less reliable of course your representation quality is going to suffer so that sort of goes down very quickly in the sort of blue line uh, we uh, experimented with, with this technique called model distillation where you take your initial network uh, and you use that to generate labels uh, so you look at the output of that network and you look at the sort of confidence in the outputs to generate labels for a second network and that's called model distillation so model distillation generally performs better than the pre-trained network and you can see that all across so as the amount of label noise increases the distillation model actually is much better than the original model and finally towards the end we have cluster fit uh, so that's the green line and you can see that the cluster fit model is consistently better than uh, basically any of these methods either distillation or pre-training and consistently gives better results uh including when you have zero label noise which is basically when you have a pre-trained image net network okay uh so we uh, applied yes, question can yes. you elaborate on the difference between distillation and cluster fit once more yes so in distillation uh i'll go back to this picture yes so in distillation what you would do is you would basically uh so in this first step you would take the pre-trained network and you would use the labels this network is predicting so say the, the network basically predicts 1000 classes so you basically use those labels uh, in a softer fashion to generate generate labels for your images so um, say the network was trained to predict uh, 100 different types of dogs so you take your images and you uh, get a distribution over the 100 different types of dogs and use that distribution to train your second network whereas in cluster fit you don't really care about the label space or the sort of output uh, output space of the pre trained network you only look at the features you don't even look at the last fully connected layer you just look at the previous features got it also why would the softer distribution help with training like why would training on this be help what's like the intuition behind distillation so a distillation's main intuition is basically that if your network was trained really well uh, so suppose you had no label noise uh, this because a lot of things are not really uh, a lot of images really don't belong in the in the sort of same classes so suppose your data set actually had 100, 200 different types of dogs but you had only 100 of them labeled and so for a lot of these images say you actually had to assign you know you had to pick basically which one of the dogs it was a software distribution is basically going to help you discover hidden categories so it it's basically 0.5 kind this kind type of dog and 0.5 this kind of dog so basically having these sort of software labels uh, helps you enhance sort of the initial class distribution that you have okay thank you Good. Uh, right, right, right. Okay. So we applied this method to uh, the self-supervised learning. Uh, so the jigsaw task that we I had talked about earlier, and we were able to see surprising amounts of gains across a bunch of data sets. So the jigsaw method is in the top row, uh, which and I'm in each of the sort of columns you're looking at the transfer performance of basically uh, this uh, jigsaw method on a bunch of different data sets. If you apply cluster fit to uh, this jigsaw method, you actually can see gains across all of these data sets, and they're fairly consistent. Uh, and we perform this test on a bunch of different pre-training methods like Rotnet, uh, so predicting rotations. Uh, and again, we could see fairly nice gains across these uh, four different data sets. And surprisingly enough, cluster fit really works on any pre-trained network. So it can be either a fully supervised network. or a weekly supervised network uh, so say a network that was trained uh, to predict hashtags um, or a weekly supervised video network uh, 
or basically any self supervised network and in each of these cases we can observe fairly consistent and large gains uh, when, you, when you apply cluster fit so it's actually able to improve the generalization of most of these methods i think you're dragging your microphone around it's very noisy of me yeah <laughs> uh, okay. it's stuck on my laptop but anyway okay okay uh all right so uh the second thing is basically these gains were possible without extra data labels or changes in the architecture so in some way you can think of this as being a self supervised fine tuning step so you have your pre trained network and then you basically perform this cluster step which is cluster fit step which is completely self supervised or unsupervised and then you uh, can observe that the representation quality improves uh i had a question uh yes. in the in the slide that you showed the improvement with jigsaw and uh right. and by using cluster fit so in this cluster fit it is a separate thing right it is not using jigsaw at all so it is applied on top of the jigsaw method right so there was a, a pre trained network from which you extract features right so in this case that pre trained network is the jigsaw pre trained network Oh, okay. So but, you take but, the jigsaw pre-trained network, and then you basically perform cluster fit on top of it. Oh, okay. Thank you. Is there any logic why cluster fit is a good idea? Um, I think the main sort of intuition is that when you say perform the jigsaw task, the last layer uh, becomes very much fine-tuned for that particular jigsaw task, right? So we saw that accuracy go down. Yeah. Now, when you take those features and you perform clustering on it. you can think of this as basically uh you're reducing the amount of information right you if i train the second network to directly regress the features of the first network i would basically get the same exact network but if i train the second network only to predict what images are grouped together in the first one i'm actually predicting lesser information uh and i thinking is basically that clustering is some kind of a noise removal technique so it's really removing all the artifacts that are specific to jigsaw uh from that like feature space and so the second network is actually learning something slightly more generic all right thanks and um, that's sort of the reason for like this experiment as well so in this case we sort of empirically validate that hypothesis by actually injecting amount of label noise so the last layer basically is going to get more and more noisy and when you do cluster fit on top of this you actually see, again see improvement so that's sort of our validation of this hypothesis uh i had another question uh uh so did you measure the performance of cluster fit on object detection like did it perform as well or was it just great in classification so it performs well in detection as well uh so it actually performs well uh in det- yes so there were initial experiments on detection that where it actually does perform well um we did not really push a lot on the detection aspect of it uh, in this particular paper uh we were sort of more interested in the retrieval or uh like linear classification kind of experiments okay because i was thinking if we are like uh making these pseudo labels we are basically making it amenable to a classification task instead of a detection task maybe we could lose one of some of those features that jigsaw got right that is possible um at least the initial experiments that i had run did not seem to suggest this uh, there was improvement in detection it was minor but detection improvements overall like the gap in performance is already so small that the improvements are actually yeah they're generally very small in general okay thank you uh, yeah. uh, i had a doubt uh, yes. uh, in the same cluster fit algorithm mm-hmm. so uh, will the final layer of cluster fit algorithm not get again covariant to the to the labels that were used for uh, training it on that task uh, it becomes less covariant so what we found was if you were to sort of uh, the paper has this plot i don't have it in the slides unfortunately the paper has the plot where uh, okay this particular plot where we were looking at con1 to res5 cluster fit is much better so the res5 to res4 gap for cluster fit is much smaller than it is for say jigsaw or rotnet but was it better than res4 or was it was slightly worse so it was on on voc on classification it was better but for say uh, other tasks like imagine it was slightly worse so it did not completely fix the problem okay thank you which was sort of the motivation for pearl uh, so basically i'll not talk about pearl uh, 
So Perl was sort of uh, born from the hypothesis again that you need to be invariant to these pretext tasks. So before I get into the details of Perl, I will talk really a little bit about uh, in general contrastive learning. How many minutes do I have, by the way? Uh, 15 minutes, more or less. Cool. Okay, good. That works. So great. Uh, so contrastive learning is basically a sort of general framework that tries to learn a feature space that can uh, combine together or sort of uh, put together points that are related and push apart points that are not related. So in this case, uh, imagine like the blue boxes are the related points, the greens are the related, and the purple are the related points. You'll extract features for each of these, like each of these data points through a shared network, so which is called a Siamese network. You'll get a bunch of image features for these uh, each of these data points. And then you'll apply a loss function, which is a contrastive loss function, which is going to try to put, uh, like sort of minimize the distance between the blue points as opposed to, say, the distance between the blue point and the green point. Or uh, the distance basically between the blue point should be less than the distance between the blue point and the green point or the blue point and the purple point. So embeddings from the related samples should be much closer than embeddings from the unrelated samples. So that's sort of the general idea of contrastive learning. And of course, Jan was one of the first people to sort of propose this method uh, in his earlier paper with Raya Hatzel, uh, which is called Dr. Lim. And so contrastive learning has now made a resurgence in self-supervised learning. Pretty much a lot of the self-supervised state-of-the-art methods are really based on contrastive learning. Uh, and the main question is, how do you define what is related and unrelated? So in the case of supervised learning, that's fairly clear. All of the dog images are related images, All and uh, any image that is not a dog image is basically an unrelated image. But it's not so clear how to define this related and unrelatedness in the case of self-supervised learning. The other sort of main difference from something like a pretext task is that contrastive learning really reasons about the entire, or like a lot of data at once. So to go back to my previous slide, uh, this, if you look at the loss function, it always involves multiple images, right? It involves, uh, so in the first row, it involves basically the blue images and the green images. In the second row, it involves the blue images and the purple images. Whereas if you look at a task like say jigsaw or a task like rotation, you're always reasoning about a single image independently. Uh, so that's sort of another difference with uh, contrastive learning. Contrastive learning always reasons about multiple data points at once. Right. So now coming to the question, how do you define related or unrelated images? Uh, you can actually use similar techniques to what I was talking about earlier. You can use frames of a video. So you can use the sort of sequential nature of data uh, so to so, sort of understand that frames that are uh, nearby in a video are related and frames say from a different video or which are further away in time are unrelated. And that sort of has formed the basis of a lot of self-supervised learning methods in this area. So if you know of this popular method called CPC, which is contrastive predictive coding, that really relies on the sequential nature of a signal. And it basically says that samples that are close by uh, in like the time space are related and samples that are further apart in the time space are unrelated. And there's a fairly a large amount of work um, basically exploiting this. Um, it can either be in the speech uh, domain, it can either be in video, it can be in text, or it can be in uh, regular images. And recently we've also been working on video and audio. So basically saying uh, this is um, that a video and its corresponding audio are related samples and a video and uh, audio from a different image uh, video are basically unrelated samples. And uh, some of the early work in uh, like uh, sort of uh, self-supervised learning also use this uh, contrastive learning method and the way they defined related samples was fairly interesting. So you run a tracker, uh, an object tracker over a video and that sort of gives you a bunch, like a sort of moving patch. And what you say is that any uh, patch that was tracked by my tracker is related to my original patch, whereas any patch from a different video is, is a not related patch. Uh, 
And so that basically gives you these bunch of related and unrelated samples. So if you look at, in this case, uh, figure C, where you have this like distance notation, uh, what this network tries to learn is basically that patches that are coming from the same video are related and patches that are coming from a, from different videos are not related. And so in some way, it automatically learns about different poses of an object. So a cycle viewed from like different viewing angles um, or like different poses of a dog. And it tries to sort of group them together. So in general, uh, if you just talk about images, a lot of work uh, is done on um, looking at nearby image patches versus distant patches. So most of the sort of CPC version one and CPC version two methods are really a sort of exploiting this property of images. So what you do is you have image patches that are uh, close by, you call them as positives and image patches that are further apart, uh, like far farther away in the image are considered as negatives. And then you basically just minimize a contrastive loss using this sort of definition of positives and negatives. Uh, the more sort of popular uh, or like pop, uh, performant way of doing this is to look at patches coming from an image uh, and contrast them with patches coming from a different image. So this sort of forms the basis of a lot of popular methods uh, like instance discrimination, MoCo, Perl, SimClear. Uh, the idea is basically uh, what's shown in the image. To sort of get into more detail, what these methods do is they extract two completely random patches from an image. So these patches can be overlapping, uh, they can actually be con contained within one another, or they can be completely far apart. And then applies some sort of data augmentation. So in this case, say a color jittering or removing the color or so on. And then you define these two patches to be your sort of positive examples. You extract another patch from a different image. And this is again a random patch. And that basically becomes your negative. And a lot of these methods will extract a lot of negative patches, and then they will basically perform contrastive learning. Uh, so you are relating two positive samples, but you have a lot of negative samples that you're contrasting this against. So the now moving to Perl a little bit, uh, let's sort of try to understand what the main difference of pretext tasks is and what how contrastive learning is sort of very different from pretext tasks. So the one thing I already mentioned was pretext tasks always reason about a single image at once. So the idea is that given an image, you apply a transform to that image. So in this case, say a jigsaw transform. And then you give, basically uh, input this transformed image into a connet and you try to predict the property of the transform that you applied. So the permutation that you applied or the rotation that you applied or the kind of color that you removed and so on. So the pretext tasks always reason about a single image. And the second thing is that the task that you're performing uh, in this case really has to capture some property of the transform. So it really needs to capture the exact permutation that you applied or the kind of rotation that you applied, which means that the last layer representations are actually going to co-vary or sort of vary a lot as the transform T uh, changes. And that is by design because you're really trying to solve that pretext task. But unfortunately, what this means is that the last layer representations uh, capture a very low level property of the signal. So they capture like things like rotation or so on. Whereas what is sort of designed or what is expected of these representations is that they are sort of invariant to these things that you should be able to recognize a cat no matter whether the cat is upright or whether the cat is say, you know, bent towards like by 90 degrees. Whereas when you're solving that particular pretext task, you're imposing the exact opposite thing. You're saying that I should be able to recognize whether this picture is upright or whether this picture is basically tilted sideways. Uh, so there are many exceptions in which you really want these low level representations to uh, be covariant and a lot of it really has to do on the task that you're performing and quite a few tasks in 3D really want to be predictive. So you want to sort of predict what camera transforms you have when you're, when you're looking at two views of the same object or so on. But unless you have that kind of a specific application for a lot of semantic tasks, you really want to be invariant to the transform that are used as in, used at input. So 
invariance has sort of been the workhorse for uh, feature learning. So something like SIF, which is a fairly popular uh, handcrafted feature, the I in SIF really stands for invariant. Uh, and supervised networks, for example, supervised AlexNets or supervised ResNets, they're trained to be invariant data augmentation. You want it, want this network to classify different crops or different rotations of this image as a tree, uh, rather than ask it to predict what exactly was the transformation applied to the input. So this is what inspired Perl. Uh, so Perl stands for Pretext Invariant Representation Learning, where the idea is that you want the representation to be invariant or capture as little information as possible of, of the input transform. So you have the image, you have the transformed version of the image, you feed forward both of these uh, images through a continent, you get a representation, and then you basically encourage these representations to be similar. So uh, in terms of the notation I was talking about earlier, you basically say that uh, the image I and any pretext transformed version of this image I are related samples and any other image is an unrelated sample. So in this way, when you train this network, this uh, representation hopefully contains very little information about this transformed T. Uh, and yes, you train it using contrastive learning. So the contrastive learning part is to basically uh, you have, say, feature VI coming from the original image I, and you have the uh, feature VIT coming from the transformed version, and you want both of these representations to be the same. And in the paper, we looked at uh, two different uh, state-of-the-art pretext transforms. So that is the jigsaw and the rotation method that I talked about earlier. And we also explored combinations of these transforms. So apply both the jigsaw and rotation at the same time. So in some way, this is like multitask learning, but you're not really trying to predict both jigsaw and rotation, you're trying to be invariant to both jigsaw and rotation. So the key thing that has sort of made uh, contrastive learning work well in the past, like sort of successful attempts, is really using a large number of negatives. Um, and one of the good sort of papers that introduced this was this instance discrimination paper from 2018. Uh, which introduced this concept of a memory bank. Uh, and this is powered, I would say, most of the sort of recent methods, which are state of the art, including Moco, Perl. Uh, and they're all sort of built and sort of hinged on this idea of a memory bank. Can I ask you to unplug your headphones from the computer because it's very noisy? Because it's, the microphone is picked from the headphones. And oh. that's been very... Is it better now? Uh, maybe, I don't know, let's try. Okay, let's try. Right. Uh, so the memory bank uh, is a sort of nice way to get a large number of negatives uh, without really increasing the sort of compute requirement. So what you do is you store a feature vector per image uh, in sort of memory, and then you use that feature vector in your contrastive learning. So, okay, let's sort of uh, first talk about how you would do this entire Perl setup without using a memory bank. So you have an image I, you have an image IT, you feed forward both of these images, um, you get a feature vector F of VI from like the original image I, you get a feature G of VIT from uh, the transformed versions, the patches in this case. And what you want is the features F and G to be similar, and you want features from any other image, uh, so an unrelated image to basically be dissimilar. So in this case, uh, what we now can do is rather than uh, if we want a lot of negatives, we would really want a lot of these negative images to be feed forward at the same time, which really means that you need a very large batch size to be able to do this. Uh, and of course, a large batch size means is not really sort of good, uh, is not possible on say a limited amount of GPU memory. So the way to sort of do that is to use something called a memory bank. So what this memory bank does is that it stores a feature vector for each of the images in your data set. And when you're doing contrastive learning, rather than using feature vectors, say from a different uh, negative image, or sort of a different image in your batch, you can just retrieve these features from a memory. So you can just retrieve features of any other unrelated image from the memory, and you can just substitute that to perform contrastive learning. So in Perl, we divided the objective into two parts. Uh, there was a, in, like a contrastive term to bring 
the feature vector from the uh, transformed image, so G of VI, similar to the representation that we have in the memory, so M of I. And similarly, we have a second contrastive term that tries to bring the feature F of VI uh, close to the feature representation that we have in memory. So essentially, G is being pulled close to MI and F is being cl pulled close to MI. So by transitivity, F and G are being pulled close to one another. And the reason for separating this out was uh, it sort of uh, stabilized training and we were able to train uh, uh, without doing this, basically the training would not really converge. And so by separating this out into two forms, rather than uh, doing like direct contrastive learning between F and G, we were able to stabilize training and actually get it working. So the way to evaluate this is basically uh, like by standard sort of pre-training evaluation setup. So transfer learning, where we can pre-train on images without labels. So the standard way of doing this is to take ImageNet, throw away the labels and pretend it is uh, unsupervised and then evaluate using say full fine tuning or using a training a linear classifier. The second thing we did was also uh, test Perl and its robustness to images, image distributions by training it on in the wild images. So we just took 1 million images randomly from Flickr. Uh, so this is the YFCC data set. And then we basically perform transfer learning, uh, sorry, uh, pre-training on these images and then perform transfer learning on uh, different data sets. So um, I, I had a question uh, about the Perl method, uh, about the memory bank where uh, the uh, M, wouldn't those like uh, feature representations stored in the memory bank be like out of date? So, right. right. Yeah, so they do go a little bit out of date, but in practice, it really does not make that much of a difference. Uh, so there, there's sort of particular way of updating them using, uh, so M of I is a moving average of the representation F. Um, and that sort of moving average, although it's stale, uh, it actually does not matter a lot in practice. You can still continue to use them. Okay. So, so assuming like I, I recently read the paper SimClear, which mm -hmm. used a huge batch size, like 8,000 or something. Mm -hmm. So it, using like the memory bank uh, approach uh, mm -hmm. and, and getting these 8,000 examples in one loss function, is that possible? Like, uh, yes. So the sort of, um, uh, Simpler way of doing it really requires a large batch size because you're getting negatives from different images in the same batch. Whereas if you use something like the memory bank, you really do not need a large batch size. So you can train this with like 32 images in a batch uh, because all the negatives are really coming from the memory bank, which does not really require you to do multiple feed forwards. Okay, thank you. If you're using memory bank, then you can't back propagate to the negative example. So is that not a problem? Uh, in, it does not create that much of a problem, really. So uh, that was one thing I was worried about as well. Uh, so in the initial versions, we did try something which was uh, like using a larger batch size. But when we switched to something like the memory bank, uh, it did not really uh, reduce performance. Uh, like very, very little, very marginal reduction in performance. Okay, and any intuition why that's the case? So I think overall contrastive learning is so, uh, fairly slow to converge. So all like all methods, SimClear and like the latest version of Moco and so on, all of them train for very large number of epochs anyway. So the number of backdrops that you're getting or the number of up memory sort of parameter updates that you're doing are very large in general. So the fact that you miss out on one of them in this particular case probably does not have that much of an effect. Okay, thanks. Last five minutes. Yes. Cool, almost there. Uh, so yeah, we basically uh, evaluate Perl on a bunch of different tasks. So the first thing was object detection. Uh, again, sort of standard task uh, in vision. And in this case, Perl was able to outperform ImageNet supervised training on detection for both the VOC 07 and 7 plus 12 data sets. Um, and it, outperforms on the sort of most stricter evaluation criterion, which is AP all, uh, which is now introduced by Coco, which was already sort of a positive sign that it was able to do this. Uh, the second thing we looked at was basically evaluating Perl on semi-supervised learning. And once again, Perl was performing fairly well. Uh, it was actually better than say, the pretext task of Jigsaw. So the only difference between the top row and the bottom row is the fact that Perl is an invariant version, whereas Jigsaw is a covariant version. Uh, 
And in terms of linear classification, when Perl came out, it was basically at par with CPC's latest version and was performing fairly well on a bunch of different uh, like parameter settings and a bunch of different architectures. And of course, now you can have like fairly good performance by methods like SimClear. So that number for SimClear uh, corresponding would basically be about 69 or 70 uh, compared to like Perl's 63-ish number. Uh, the other thing we looked at was basically uh, how Perl sort of generalizes across data distributions. So for this, we looked at just Flickr images from the YFCC data set. And Perl was able to sort of outperform methods that were trained using 100 times more data. So the jigsaw row in the second, sec like the jigsaw row, which is the second row, was trained on 100 million images, um, whereas Perl was just trained on 1 million images. And uh, despite that, it's actually able to sort of outperform the jigsaw method fairly easily. This again shows you the power of in like sort of baking invariance into your representation rather than sort of predicting uh, pretext tasks. And finally, the sort of thing I started out with, which is that whether this thing is actually semantic. So if you look at different layers of representations, so con one to res five, jigsaw basically shows a drop in performance from res four to res five. Whereas for Perl, you can sort of see a sort of nicely increasing graph, where res four and res five get increasingly more and more semantic. Uh, in terms of problem complexity, Perl was very good at handling that because you're never predicting the number of permutations, you're just using them at input as like sort of data augmentation. So Perl can sort of scale very well to all the 360,000 uh, possible permutations in the nine patches. Whereas for Jigsaw, because you're predicting that, you're very limited by the size of your output space. And the paper also shows that we can extend uh, Perl to not just like, it's not limited to Jigsaw, you can do that on rotation. You can in fact do it on a combination of Jigsaw and rotation and you can get more and more gains when you basically start doing this. Um, so basically, if you look at these methods, starting from pretext tasks to clustering to Perl, as you go from the left to the right, you basically get more and more invariance. And in some way, you also see an increase in performance, which uh, sort of suggests that baking in more and more invariance to your methods is actually going to be more helpful in the long longer term. There are uh, some shortcomings, which is basically that we really do not understand what are the set of data transforms that matter. So Jigsaw works really well, but it's not very clear why this is happening. Uh, so some sort of future work, or if you want to spend your spare cycles thinking about something, is really understanding what invariances really matter when you're trying to solve a supervised task. What invariances really matter for something like ImageNet? Uh, and that's it. Uh, so basically predict more and more information and try to be as invariant as possible. Thank you. Uh, hey, Ishan. Uh, so I had a question. Yes. Uh, these contrastive networks, they can't use the batch norm layer, right? Because then information would uh, pass from one sample to the other and then the network might uh, learn a very trivial way of uh, separating the negatives from the positive. Like, uh, so it uh, like for Perl, for example, we really did not uh, observe that phenomenon at all. So we did not really have to do any special tricks with batch norm. We were able to use batch norm as is. Okay. Uh, and it's not necessary for all the contrastive networks to not be using batch norm. It's okay to have the batch norm layer. It's a, yeah. It's I mean, uh, for example, for SimClear and so on, they try move to sync batch norm because they want to emulate a large batch size. So you might have to do some tweaks in batch norm, um, but basically, if you you cannot avoid it really because if you completely remove batch norm, then training these like very deep networks is generally very hard anyway. Okay. Uh, do you think uh, that uh, Perl paper works uh, with the batch norm layers because it uses a memory bank and uh, all the representations are not uh, taken at the same time? Whereas I think Moco, they specifically mention not to use the batch norm layer or use it uh, spread across multiple GPUs. Right. So that, that I think is one difference for sure because um, basically the negatives that you're contrasting against and the positive would, are from different time steps, which makes it harder for batch norm to sort of cheat. Uh, whereas for the other methods uh, like MoCo and SimClear, they're very correlated to the particular batch that you're evaluating right now. 
Okay, so is there any suggestion if we are using a n pair uh, loss rather than a memory bank? Is there any suggestion how to go about this? Whether we should just stick to AlexNet and VGG, which don't use a batch norm layer, or uh, is there any way to turn it off? Or so, what's a? Can you describe the setting a little bit more? Uh, so basically, what I'm trying to do is uh, train on uh, uh, frames of videos, and mm-hmm. I'm using a n pair setting mm-hmm. where I'm trying to contrast between n samples rather than two or three samples. Okay. And uh, what I'm worried about is whether I should be using batch norm or not. And if I'm not using batch norm at all, then which pre-trained, uh, uh, sorry, pre-architectured models can I use? Um. That's tricky. So the one problem with video frames is basically they're fairly correlated. Uh, so in general, batch norm basically um, the performance of batch norm degrades when you have fairly correlated samples. Uh, so with video, that becomes more and more a problem. The unfortunate uh, sort of uh, like the sad news is basically that even uh, like if you look at a typical implementation of AlexNet these days, it will include batch norm. It's just because it's much more stable to train with that. You can train with a higher learning rate and a lot. You can basically use it for a bunch of different downstream tasks. So I think you may still have to use batch norm. Um, if not, you can give other variants like group norm uh, a try, which basically do not really depend on the batch size. Okay, makes sense. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Ishan. Um, it was uh, a lot of... Uh, no interesting details. I think we still have like eight minutes if people are, I think there are like still many uh, left in class. Any questions? Uh, yep. Uh, I had one question, which I had also put forward in a lecture when we were discussing Perl. So uh, this question is about the loss function. Right. Um, can I ask that right now? Uh, yeah, go for it. Okay. So uh, when I read the paper, so there was a probability term that we were computing after computing the VI and the VIT representations for image and the transformed version. And um, after getting those probabilities, then we were using a a noise contrastive estimation loss. So I was kind of confused that uh, wouldn't it had been better if just the negative log of that probability had been minimized. So... You can use both, uh, really. So the reason to use NC was basically more to do with how the memory bank paper was set up. Uh, so NC, you would, if you have K negatives, you are basically solving K plus one problems. So the one problem is, bas- uh, uh, you basically have K plus one different binary problems that you're solving. Um, so that's one way of doing it. The other way of doing it is basically what is now called info NC, which is really just softmax. So you just apply a softmax and you minimize the negative log likelihood for that. Yes, because that H, uh, the probability function looked like a softmax. So I just right. thought so right. so, directly uh, minimized. Yes. Uh, in, so at the time when I had tried it out, it actually gave me slightly worse results. Uh, and so that's basically why I used NC. And this was just initial experiments. Uh, now, when I'm trying it out, it actually gives me similar results. So I guess in the end, it does not make that much of a difference. Yeah, um, this is more related to the course, but uh, we are going to have a project for on self-supervised learning. So I was wondering, can you give us information on how to um, get it, get a self-supervised learning model working? Uh, as in the implementation details, like this has been a lecture on the high, overall high level idea. So right. how to get it working quickly. Mm. So I think, I mean, there are a certain class of techniques that are going to be much easier to get working from the get go. Right. So for example, if you were looking at just pretext tasks, uh, then you would basically look at uh, something like rotation because okay it's a very easy task to implement uh, you really cannot go wrong with it with i mean there are just very few things to implement so just the number of moving pieces is a good indicator uh, the other thing to remain uh, remember is basically if you're sort of implementing a uh, existing method then there are going to be lots of tiny details the authors talk about so for example the exact learning rate that they used or the way they used batch norm or so on if there are lots of these things, then basically it's going to be harder and harder for you to sort of reproduce or um, more and more things for you to get wrong. Okay. Um, 
uh, second thing to remember is data augmentation the data augmentation is really critical so if you get anything working you would try to sort of add more data augmentations to it okay and um, would you recommend us trying poll or do you think that'll be too difficult to do in one month uh i'm not sure what the setting is really so i'm not sure if i can comment on that okay thanks uh when okay. just one more thing on did you try using momentum contrast on poll instead of memd bank uh i haven't uh, so we basically moved to the end to end version which is like similar to what simtier is uh so the thing is i mean you can basically gather a bunch of negatives from uh, different gpus so in case your batch size uh that actually generally helps a lot uh i would suspect moco would help a lot as well i um, think moco got improved performance over simtier by replacing end to end training with moco but i think the numbers are still fairly similar uh and there are small differences in evaluation protocols that you would sort of see across these papers so uh yeah i think so we're okay. planning to sort of release a more standardized evaluation benchmark so we did that last year unfortunately that was in cafe 2 so we're trying to sort of release something in pytorch now uh, okay. which will provide a lot of standardized implementations so like perl and a bunch of these and a standardized evaluation protocol for everything all right thanks a lot uh ishan i had a question about uh, about this um, self supervised learning so uh, what do you think is the state of like generative methods and did you think about combining like uh, contrastive methods with generative methods like uh, simpler uh, actually like has uh, a different space so they have like a linear layer on top of the feature representation where they compute the actual feature representation where they did the contrastive loss the nce stuff so like do you think like having another head like that basically uh given like a crop of image you just try to scale out that crop of image uh and you have that information because you you crop that image right and you right. still like gan or something so i mean it is uh definitely a good idea uh i think it's just the tricky part is getting these things to train is just non trivial um so initially like i haven't really tried any generative approaches um in my experience that's slightly more finicky and harder to get to work um but i do agree i think sort of in the longer term they are like they are sort of the things to focus on thank you last question no that's it i guess Oh I can actually ask a question. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So this is regarding distillation actually. So you were telling me how predicting softer distributions give gives a richer uh target, right? Right. So can you elaborate on that because it sort of increases the uncertainty of our model, right? Like we are predicting from a one hot distribution and then making it softer and then we are predicting on that so more uncertainty. and moreover like why do they call it distillation because i sort of feel like you need more parameters to account for this richer uh richer target right so uh the one thing is basically um if you train on one hot labels your models tend to be very over confident in general so if you have heard of these tricks called like label smoothing uh which is sort of now being used by a bunch of methods Label smoothing is like you can think of it like the sort of simplest version of distillation. So you have a one-hot vector that you were trying to predict, but rather than trying to predict that entire one-hot vector, what you do is you take some probability mass out of that. So you would predict one and a bunch of zeros. So rather than doing that, you predict say point nine seven, and you add point one, point one, point one to like the remainder three labels. So you just add a uniform distribution to the remainder. So distillation is a sort of more informed way of doing this. So rather than uh um, like randomly uh, sort of up, like increasing the probability of a random unrelated class to actually have a network which was pre-trained which is pretty good to this um in general software distributions are very useful for pre-training methods because um uh, models tend to be overconfident um pre-training on like software distribution is actually slightly easier as an optimization problem so you converge slightly faster as well uh so both of these benefits are present in distillation and also like something with label smoothing 
Also because like smooth labels allow you to have like a, a dog looking cat or a cat looking dog, right? So if you have a very big network that has been trained on very many samples, it will actually have, you know, a idea, a proper idea of what is, you know, an ambiguous perhaps image, right? And therefore, uh, if you can actually learn that soft idea, you're going to be learning more than uh, if you just give that, you know, uh, one hot uh, label. I think we are yeah. running out of time. I think we are out of time like half an hour ago, but this was the question answering question and answers uh, session. Uh, if there are no, you know, really, really urgent questions still pending, I will be calling it, uh, uh, call the end of the, to the lesson. So thank you for tuning in. I see you tomorrow at the uh, practi practical session. Don't forget to come. Um, and that was it. So thank you so much, uh, Ishan. And I see you around. Thank you, Ishan. Thank you, everyone. Take care, everyone. All right. Bye-bye.